Hi everyone, in today's episode we get to learn about Walt Disney and all his challenges, failures, and how it led to him being the legend. Coming up! In today's episode, you're going to feel empowered, unstoppable, and gain the tools to accomplish anything you can dream of, using real examples from some of the most successful entrepreneurs in the world. That's all happening today on the I Can Show. What's up everyone, my name is James Martin and welcome to once again the very first episode of the I Can Show podcast. The show that showcases the realm of possibilities and how you can succeed in your passion. I'm super excited to show you about all the different things that we can do together. It's super important that you understand that no matter where you are in life, no matter what your interest, your passion is, it's very important that you do understand there's always a way to make a living, there's always a way to make a career out of what you're interested in doing. So please stick around to the podcast, and if there's anything that really resonates with you by the end of this episode, please let me know in the comments, or shoot us an email at magiccutmedia at gmail.com. Let me know your thoughts, and let's get started. So, today we're going to talk about Walt Disney, and... The main reason why I really wanted to talk about Walt Disney in the very first episode was because, to be honest, Walt Disney is like my favorite entrepreneur in the history of mankind. Like, the guy's a legend, okay? And just, it's everything about his beliefs, his philosophy, and the environments that he creates just really, really gets me and chokes me up sometimes. So I really wanted to dedicate the very first episode to him because, I mean, again, the show is all about thinking about the realm of possibilities. I mean, he went beyond the realm of possibilities. Like, he did everything in his possible power. And it's just, I won't spoil too much, but let's get into the episode and I'll tell you all about it. So, to give you a bit of an idea on where Walt Disney started... So Walt Disney was born December 5th, 1901, and he was born in Chicago, Illinois, to Elias and Flora Disney. Walt showed an interest in drawing in his childhood and would often copy cartoons and even sometimes got paid to draw sketches for other people. At age 10, Walt and his brother Roy were delivering newspapers. The two brothers would do that for the next six years. Walt took any chance he could to draw cartoons, such as drawing for his school's newspaper, and eventually joined the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts to further pursue his passion. Later, Walt attempted to join the army to fight in World War I, but didn't get in for being too young, but he joined the Red Cross as an ambulance driver in September 1918. This is where it gets interesting. His early career started in January 1920, so he was 19. He launched his very first business as E-Works Disney Commercial Artist. So they both started out this business, but it never attracted any customers, so both E-Works and Disney had to quit their business and found work at the Kansas City Ad Company. In 1921, Disney partnered with a co-worker named Fred Harmon to start a new business that would produce short cartoons known as Newman's Laughograms. Unfortunately, the studio fell into bankruptcy just two years later. Now, that's, that's kind of interesting to me because, I mean, I'm actually not too much older than how than Walt Disney was at that point. The first two businesses utterly failed. Kind of interesting. October 1923, Walt and Roy founded the Disney Brother Cartoon Studio, which later would become the Walt Disney Studios and Walt Disney Productions. This is where things really get interesting. This is one of my favorite stories to talk about whenever it comes around Walt Disney. So... For those of you who are writers, for those of you who are filmmakers, something that you need to understand about people that create characters, that create stories, it gets very, very personal. Artists usually tend to get very, very drawn, very close to, well, their art. So it can get very difficult, especially if you're put in the situation that Walt was going to get himself into. In the 1920s, Disney's was introduced to Charles Mintz, an American producer and distributor, after the two worked on releasing his Alice in Wonderland short films beforehand. In 1927, Charles would present Disney with a deal at Universal Studios to work with his partner Eworks and would create Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. It was a peppy, alert, saucy, adventurous character. The plan for Oswald was to produce a series of short cartoons during the 1920s and 30s. Oswald's animated series was a humongous hit and became a bankable character and a masterpiece. So already we're getting to see Disney's very first success. Now, behind the scenes of Oswald, 
The studio and Walt Disney never got along. The studio wanted Oswald to be a regular funny tune character, like most other cartoon characters at the time, but Walt Disney wanted Oswald to, tr to be a believable character with emotions and wanted him to have a personality, so there was a lot of butting heads. During the major success of Oswald cartoon series, Charles Mintz had been secretly negotiating deals with the animators who had been working for Walt Disney on creating the series and was offering them to work on the character and continue the series without Walt Disney. After Walt spent a little bit of time in Los Angeles between work, he was going to go back to New York, meet up with Charles Mintz to renew a contract to continue the show, but he found out that Charles had already gone behind his back without him knowing getting the animators, stole the rights to the character, and eventually Walt ended up losing the project altogether. While most people might take this as a huge disappointment, a huge setback, and would just, some people play sad, some people get upset, and then they just play victimhood. They, they don't do anything about it, and they just go home and, you know, just pout. Walt would go on the train back home to, to his home in Los Angeles, very distraught and alone. But it was on the train ride home when he came up with another idea for a new character, Mickey Mouse, which would become one of his most well-known characters throughout history. Now I want to take you to what would become his very first animated feature film. So what you have to understand is so after he created Mickey Mouse, he would come up with a bunch of different comedic short films of featuring Mickey Mouse. You know, we got Steamboat Willie as an example. That became successful, and he would continue making these cartoon animated short films. But that's all they were. No one's actually gone after making a feature animated movie before. He wanted to be the first one. So they decided to work on the project called Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Snow White would be the first full-length animated feature film up to this point, there's been animated shorts, including for Disney, which up to that point was just Mickey Mouse and Silly Symphony cartoons. The project was ambitious and expensive and had a lot of risk involved, nothing that had ever been attempted before. Both Walt's wife Lillian and his brother Roy tried to talk him out of pursuing the project. Does that not sound familiar? Now, this is something that I find kind of interesting about his method of coming out with his movies. There's no one writer. Typically, whenever you make a movie, there's usually one or more writers involved, but these partners work really, really well together, and so it's easier to come up with a story. Usually, when you have more than one people on board, it creates a humongous possibility of disaster. Like, it's basically an accident waiting to happen because everyone's got ideas, everyone's got egos. It could go all sorts of places, so those are already a big risk, but the benefit of having a huge group of people contribute ideas is... You get all these sorts of ideas. Ideas that you never even would have thought of possible. So, both kind of pros and cons. Anyways. Most of the animators didn't come from a background of animating. Most of them were newspaper cartoonists. And through a combination of investors and Disney having to mortgage his home to raise the budget for the movie, the original budget, which was at $1 million, and eventually even went up to over and almost $2 million, almost doubling the original budget. I mean, $2 million is definitely on the high end of movies being produced at this time. I mean, there were live action movies like Dead End or Breakfast for Two that were costing under a $1 million. So obviously this was way on the high end. Huge risk once again. But it was very tricky. There was no sort of set goal on how the movie would look. It was always changing, always adapting, always flowing and just being morphed into whatever it was. And so there was a lot of doubt on if this movie was going to be extremely successful. Critics were already calling the movie Disney's Folly. However, on December 21, 1937, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves had a private release at the Carthay Circle Theatre. By the end of the movie, there were sniffles and tears watching the movie, which even surprised Disney that people could get emotional over a moving picture. At the end of the movie, the crowd gave a standing ovation. And then in February 1938, Snow White did a general public release and became a massive box office success. The film kept being put in more screenings throughout the U.S., Canada, and even foreign countries. To this day, the movie made $418 million worldwide and continues to be watched to this day. Gosh, I love that movie. Let me know in the comments if you've ever seen Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. 
So after the success of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, he would continue to make movies such as Song of the South, Fantasia. Now, around this time when they were working on a new pr project called Dumbo, Disney animators were getting well-paid and employee bonuses. So a great, well-received studio. In the 1930s, during the rise of World War II and the Great Depression, studios were cutting back payments for their employees. And thus, in 1938, the Screen Cartoonist Guild was formed. Disney's payment structure wasn't organized as his method was to pay employees based on their talent and amount of work. Some employees were getting $300 a week, while some were getting $12 a week. Now, obviously, a lot of the employees didn't settle for this, so they demanded that Disney would become unionized. Now, it's not to say that why would you mess a man who had a huge success. The thing was, so he would release Pinocchio in February 7, 1940, and Fantasia in November 13, 1940. Both of them bombed at the box office, and not even Snow White could save them. So on May 29, 1941, more than 200 employees went on strike at the Walt Disney Company. Walt's belief is that the more you put into your organization, the more privileges you should earn. Obviously, that didn't settle well for them. So at one point, Walt Disney ended up taking a vacation with his family, and Roy opted to settle the strike. So what ended up happening was Roy would actually unionize the studio. Everyone got equal payments, despite how much work they were contributing. So everyone was even, but it did leave a permanent scar at the Walt Disney Studio in the atmosphere of the company. Now here's something that I find very interesting about Walt Disney's life, which is, so you look at here, so now he's sort of on the top of the game. Like he's a filmmaker. He's a well-known, famous filmmaker. He already went from a cartoonist to making short films to now making animated movies. And some of them were successful, some of them were not. But... How can he continue making movies when his own studio is not the same, it doesn't have the same life, it doesn't have the same sort of family atmosphere that it did before. Everyone was, now a lot of people are a little more stingy about their payments. This is what I like about Walt Disney. This is what, to me, the true meaning of entrepreneurship actually means. Because it's not so much about sticking to like, oh, I have to be a filmmaker by the end of life, and therefore you do it. Because sometimes life changes. Such as what, Disney would experience. So often he would disappear from making the movies and would spend time with some friends that were making like these animated trains. And when I say animated trains, I'm talking about like these train models that were not so much like toys, they were a little bit bigger that you could just kind of sit on and ride around on tracks in the backyard. He was fascinated by this. He also wanted to create a clean and fun amusement park where children and families could actually enjoy themselves. The problem was that parks were expensive and were usually very, very sketchy. Plus, it's also unusual for a filmmaker to start an amusement park. But, Disney raised the funds for the park the best way he knew how. He started a TV show and made movies overseas. For instance, he would make a movie called Treasure Island, which was released in 1950, and the entire thing was cast, shot, and made in England. Disney also created the WED Enterprises, known as Walt Disney Imagineering, to create the Disneyland project. The crew he hired were referred to as Imagineers. Cool name, though. Disneyland opened up July 17, 1955. The park received 28,000 guests, consisting of not just some paid tickets, but the rest were either invited guests, counterfeit tickets, or some would even climb over the fence to get into the park. Now, during the opening of Disneyland, it was nicknamed by the executives as Black Sunday because the heat was, first off, the, ex the heat was extremely high, and then due to a plumber's strike, drinking fountains and toilets wouldn't work. Vendors would run out of food, and then asphalt that was freshly poured that morning would soften up, and some women's high heel shoes would start sinking into the asphalt. After fixing the problems, though, Walt invited most of the guests back for a second day on July 18th, which got a lot more positive feedback and continues to attract thousands and thousands, if not millions, of guests to this day. Well, where do you go from there? He created Walt Disney Land. Now he wants to create Walt Disney World. Actually, at the time, it would be referred to as Disney World. So after the success of Disneyland in 1955, the Disney company wanted to expand and create a secondary theme park 
but bigger as Walt wanted more control and have a bigger park with more of his creations. In 1959, Walt and the team would go to work to begin looking for large pieces of land to make the project. Eventually, Walt located a piece of land in Orlando, Florida that was right next to the local freeways and was near the McCoy Air Force, which would later become the Orlando International Airport. Walt Disney had to come up with fake business names so that they could purchase the 30,000 acres of land at a cheaper rate because the name Disney had become so popular that if he announced that he was the one that was purchasing the land, the price of the land would go up. The secret project stayed a secret until a local newspaper published a very large statement revealing that Disney was in fact building an East Coast version of Disneyland. So in October 1965, Walt asked the governor, Hayden Burns of Florida, to announce the project to the public and would refer to the project as the greatest attraction in the history of Florida. In 1966, a year after announcing the project, Walt was diagnosed with lung cancer. Thankfully, his team continued the mission even when Walt was in the hospital. And see, to me, this is why he's known as a legend today. Because it's not so much about you believing in your passion or a message. It's not just enough about spreading out that message or that passion. But it's a whole other thing when there's other people that will continue the message and continue to spread your work and your passion and the message that you've been trying to convey even while you're gone. Because... Unfortunately, Walt Disney would pass away on December 15th, 1966. And I've watched so many different documentaries and it makes me cry just thinking about it sometimes. And just the crew would just describe how hurtful everyone felt that Walt Disney was gone. I even remember watching this one documentary, I can't name it off the top of my head, but I remember in this one documentary when someone would, would try and sort of give a pep talk to the crew and say that Walt Disney isn't gone at the moment, he's actually just on vacation and he'll be back soon. And so by the time he gets back, let's try and get this project completed and let's have, let's have everything in place. Walt Disney World opened October 1, 1971 and would become known as the happiest place on earth and would even expand internationally with parks in Paris, France and Tokyo, Japan. Love, love, love Walt Disney. So, I want to hear from you right now. Is there anything that you heard from Walt Disney's story or his life that really just inspires you? If there is, I want you to let me know down in the comments wherever you're watching this podcast or listening to it. Or you can just send me an email to magicupmedia at gmail.com. I want to know your thoughts. And also, if you enjoy this podcast, I would love to invite you to our merchandise shop, which you can find at shop.spreadshirt.ca forward slash I can show where you can find brand new teasers such as the I can do anything I believe in t-shirt as well as own your inner dorkness. You can find all this on the shop link is in the description down below or you can search this up later if you like. If you're able to purchase any merchandise it also helps us to continue with the podcast and if you got any benefit out of this I would love to invite you to either follow us on social media and please share this podcast to all your friends and family. Let me know how you think of this podcast. I can't wait to hear your thoughts and I hope you join us next time on another episode of the I Can Show. I'll see you next time.